Well, Pioneer Church, it is a joy to be with you all uh, this morning. Um, If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 3. As Trell mentioned, we'll be in verses 21 to 35. Uh, But before we dive into the text, I just want to say how much of a joy it is to be with you all uh, this morning. Um, Yeah, I bring you greetings from the saints at Oakhurst Baptist Church. Uh, You all are regularly on our hearts and on our minds. Uh, particularly through prayer. Uh, We pray for you all very regularly uh, that the Lord would continue to strengthen the gospel witness not too far from us, 40, 40, 45 minutes down the road. Uh, And so it's a joy to finally be here to see the good gospel work uh, that is going on. And and much like Trell mentioned, I've been an encouragement to him. He's been an encouragement to me. Uh, You know, once we kind of realize, hey, we're going to be in the same area coming down south, kind of finishing up our time in D.C., uh, we just made it a point to to try to meet together quarterly or so just for mutual encouragement as we both seek to, to labor and see the gospel go out uh, in our respective cities. So, uh, brother, you've been a joy and a, and a, and a, a source of, of wisdom and counsel for me um, and encouragement for me as we navigate all kinds of topics, fatherhood and pastoring and everything in between. So, um, y'all, it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you for having me. Let's go ahead and go to, to God in prayer and ask him for his help to understand his word before we dive in. Let's pray. All wise God, as we consider your word this morning, we pray uh, that you would grant us wisdom uh, in order to see you rightly. Uh, By your grace, grow us uh, in love for your son Jesus and in what he has accomplished on our behalf. Uh, Be exalted, O God, as we turn to the scriptures that are able to make us wise unto salvation. Uh, In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, So like Trill mentioned in my intro, Uh, On March 3rd, 2023, uh, I became a boy dad for the third time. Uh, Our son Camden Gabriel Morgan was born, and y'all, I love being a boy dad. Uh, But as you can probably imagine, often with little boys comes a lot of energy, a lot of rambunctiousness. Uh, And one thing I noticed about myself kind of in parenting these young boys is that I tend to be an overprotective dad. You know, I'm one of those, those helicopter uh, parents. I have a tendency to, to always be wondering and looking out for their safety, but kind of over the top, in an over the top kind of way. You know, at the infant stage, they make that weird noise and I'm wondering, is he still breathing? Like I go to, to that level, right? Or, or the toddler stage, if there's a, a sharp edge or, or corner in the house somewhere and they're toddling around, I'm just, hey, get rid of the table altogether. We don't need it right now. All right, that's my response. Uh, and even now uh, with our, our older two at ages six and four, I think on average the words be careful come out of my mouth maybe 20 times a day. I'm constantly repeating that phrase. I love my boys dearly. And part of what it means for me to be a good parent to them, a good father to them, is to, is to look out for their physical well-being. Right? Don't run out in the street. Uh, don't tackle your brother. Uh, don't touch the stove. Words of warning, words of instruction, uh, words of, of exhortation. I always want to protect my sons because I I love them. I want my boys to to navigate this world uh, with wisdom. And as an earthly father, that makes makes total sense. Uh, But what does our our heavenly father have to say about walking in wisdom? Uh, In his kindness, he's not left us to kind of wonder or try to figure it out on our own, but instead he's, he's given us his word. And within his word, we find entire books that are dedicated to making us wise. Again, wise unto salvation. Uh, We'll be spending our time this morning studying a portion of one of those books, uh, the Proverbs. Uh, The Proverbs, they they aim to teach wisdom, uh, and they do so through the the use of a rhetorical device, a proverb, right? Thus the name of the book itself. What exactly is a proverb? So if you're taking notes, here's just a basic, simple definition for us. A proverb is a concise, memorable statement of a general truth, a concise, memorable statement of a uh, general truth. Uh, But I'm a Baptist pastor, so I love alliteration. So here we go. Here's another definition. You don't have to write this down. This is just for your entertainment. A proverb is a catchy, concise couplet that clearly captures a crucial concept. (laughs) I'll say it one more time. Uh, A catchy, concise couplet that clearly captures a crucial concept. Y'all, Proverbs are not unique to the Bible, right? Uh, They can be found in many cultures, Chinese Proverbs, Ethiopian Proverbs, Irish Proverbs, etc. But the Proverbs found in the Bible are unique in that they alone point to and focus on the God of the Bible. 
uh, the true source of wisdom. Now, regarding their purpose or their function, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but Proverbs are meant to help us to develop a set of practical skills for living well in God's world. There's a practical nature to Proverbs. They help you develop skills to live well in the world that God himself created. Uh, now, I know I'm just kind of dropping in with a standalone sermon here, so I want to give you a little bit of context, uh, kind of the structure of the book of Proverbs. The first nine chapters of Proverbs are really just an extended introduction. Uh, and within the extended introduction, we find 10 speeches from father to son to embrace wisdom, to, to cultivate the fear of the Lord and to live accordingly. Again, our passage for this morning is in Proverbs chapter 3. And what we find here is the fourth of those 10 exhortations from father to son. Uh, these exhortations, they are affectionate appeals uh, from father to son to live wisely in the world. Appeals that are both practical but and, and spiritual in nature. Appeals meant to help us live in the world, but also appeals that, that point us to glory. And these appeals, they are generally given through the lens of wisdom and folly. So I'm going to go ahead and read for us Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 21 and ending in verse 35. Y'all, I'm reading from the ESV, so it might sound a little different, but I trust you'll be able to follow. Starting in verse 21. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. And then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Uh, do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Uh, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, I will give it, when you have it with you. Do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Uh, do not envy a man of violence and do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. If you're taking notes uh, this morning, uh, my main idea, what I hope that you would walk away with uh, this morning is this. Gospel wisdom leads to confidence in God, compassion for neighbor, and blessing from the Lord. Gospel wisdom leads to confidence in God, compassion for neighbor, and blessing from the Lord. As we dive into the text, we'll consider three ways that the wise walk. So beginning with verses 21 to 26, 20, yeah, 21 to 26, the wise walk confidently. The wise walk uh, confidently. Solomon, the author of Proverbs, begins his affectionate appeal, my son. Do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Uh, in other words, do not let wisdom or, or understanding out of your sight. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are uh, spend much time around the game of baseball or watch baseball, but if you're familiar with baseball at all, a common refrain that you might hear as a spectator or even as a player is, are the words, good eye, good eye. Uh, teammates, coaches, or even those in the stands might, might say this, uh, when a batter uh, doesn't swing at a pitch that's outside of the strike zone, otherwise known as a ball. Right? Ideally, a batter, somebody who's standing, right, trying to hit the ball, uh, only swings at strikes, ideally. Uh, but it takes a good eye to know whether that pitch coming is a ball or a strike. Right? If you are going to hit the right pitch, you must keep your eye on the ball. Uh, similarly, like a good coach, Solomon here exhorts his son, keep your eye on the ball, right? Do not lose sight of sound wisdom and discretion. Keep them in view at all times. Wisdom, right? the ability to discern or judge what is true, right, or lasting. And then discretion, kind of the use of that wisdom, right? A person's ability to make sound or wise decisions based on the circumstances that they are in. Solomon is exhorting his son to keep his eyes on wisdom, preserve wisdom, maintain wisdom. 
And if you do, they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Right away, we see two benefits of keeping sound wisdom, life for the soul and adornment for the neck. Walking in wisdom, it has internal and external benefit. Uh, the soul, our, our innermost being, will, be, will find uh, life if we walk in wisdom. And then like a, like a necklace that's worn on the outside, right? It's worn externally uh, and is seen with the eyes as, as beautiful. Those who walk in wisdom, they, they practically make wise or, or beautiful choices in life. And that makes sense, right? God created this world, and as creator, he determines how we should live in it. As we obey his commands to live in the world the way that he intended, we can rightly expect blessing. Now, using symbolism, Solomon goes on to articulate what that blessing might actually look like. Verse 23 and 24, then you will walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. A common tool used throughout the Proverbs are these if-then statements, right? These conditional statements, if this, then that. But as we come across these statements, we have to be careful, right? As a matter of fact, when it comes to reading the Proverbs as a whole, uh, we need to keep in mind particularly two things. So consider this kind of a, a how-to on reading the Proverbs rightly. The first thing is that Proverbs by nature are probabilities, uh, Proverbs by nature are probabilities. For example, if you fear the Lord and make wise and good choices, things will likely, things will probably go well for you. And if you don't fear the Lord rightly, you're foolish and things will likely not go well for you. Proverbs show us what is often true, but not always. Proverbs are by nature, again, probabilities. The second thing that we have to keep in mind as we navigate through the rest of this proverb is that Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not promises. They are not formulas for success. The best example of this uh, would be the very popular Proverbs 22, verse 6. I'm pretty sure this was hanging above my bed as a child. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Yes, fearing God will most likely lead to a stable life. And raising your children in a stable home does indeed set them well, up well for success. But as we all know, and as life testifies, there are no guarantees. So in reading the Proverbs, we have to remember that by nature, uh, they focus on the general rule and not the exceptions, which there are a lot of. So with that in mind, kind of a framework for how we should proceed forward, uh, we, let's go ahead and tackle verses 23 to 24. We find there that walking in wisdom will likely lead to blessing, safety, sure footing, not fearing, pleasant Sleep. These are all images of blessing, right? Images meant to portray the peace that walking in wisdom produces. Those who are wise have no need to be constantly looking over their shoulder. They walk securely. Uh, those who are wise have sure footing. It reminds me of those mountain goats that you see on National Geographic walking on sheer cliffs. It's, they could fall off, but they don't, right? They're, they have sure footing. Their footing is secure. Those who are wise, they sleep without fear. The wise choices that they've made through the day lead to peace of mind and sweet sleep at night. The point here is that those who treasure wisdom get to experience the treasures of wisdom. Those who treasure wisdom get to experience the treasures of wisdom. But what about those who do not keep sound wisdom? Those who lose sight of wisdom. Uh, the Proverbs call this person a fool. The fool doesn't take God at his word. The fool ignores God and his loving commands, and as a result, find themselves in difficult situations due to their sin. So, friends, can you think of a time in which you made a foolish or sinful decision? What kind of feelings did that lead to? Guilt? Shame? Internal torment? Worry? anxiety, anger, maybe literal lack of sleep? What if she reads that email? What if he runs into that person? Who else knows about this? How can I make sure what I just did never gets out? Walking in wisdom and avoiding the foolishness of sin will likely keep your conscience clear and your mind free from worry. 
Now, thus far, Solomon has made a pretty good case uh, for why we should walk in wisdom. There are real, practical, everyday benefits from doing so. But even more important than the practical benefit of walking in wisdom, we see in verses 25 and 26 the spiritual benefit of walking in wisdom. Again, verse 25, do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Here we have the reason, right? The the ground, if you will, for why those who are wise have no need to fear, even when disaster strikes, because the Lord is their confidence. This, This grounding truth is critical because the Proverbs never imply that people can be safe through their own wisdom, right? Common sense, book smarts, street smarts, personal competence, all of that will eventually be exhausted if God's protection is missing, if he is not our confidence. Uh, this is, y'all, the climax of the passage. It's, it's the source. It's the root for all the commands and exhortations that we see coming at the rest of our passage. The promise that the Lord, Yahweh, will be our confidence, or as other translations put it, he will be at our side. The wise walk in confidence not because of their own wisdom, but because God is at their side. It is he who keeps our foot from being caught. Psalm 23, verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Right? King David could pen that psalm because his confidence was in the Lord. Uh, Wisdom walks in confidence because wisdom walks with the Lord. Friends, he is our protector, right? He is our defender. He is our provider. He is our redeemer. He is our sustainer, pioneer church. He is our friend. Biblical wisdom keeps us safe from sudden trouble because biblical wisdom points us to the God of all wisdom with whom there is refuge. Uh, Brothers and sisters, Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth, is at our side, and it's his presence that makes all the difference. You know, uh, like, a, like a soldier, think about a soldier in a foxhole in the middle of war. Uh, the man fighting next to him makes all the difference, right? If that man is scared or if that man is wounded or even worse, if that man is dead, there is no confidence to be found. What every soldier needs in battle is to know that this man next to him, the one who's fighting next to him, is fighting just as hard and with just as much skill. And that is what builds confidence, How much more confidence should we have, church, as we wage war in this fallen world, knowing that the one who hung the moon and the stars is the same one who is by your side? The one who parted the seas hears your prayers, right? The one who rose from the grave has given you his spirit, Emmanuel, God with us. Come what may. God in Christ is by your side. Therefore, we have an unshakable confidence that rests in an unshakable God. Friends, the wise walk confidently. And as we walk confidently in this wisdom that finds its roots in our vertical relationship with the Lord, this wisdom bears fruit in how we relate to others, uh, to our neighbor. This brings us to our second point for this morning, the wise walk compassionately. The wise walk compassionately. Scripture is littered with commands, and every single one of them is for our good. Uh, Some commands, they're framed in the positive, and some commands are framed in the negative. But for the ones framed in the negative, like we see in our passage for this morning, there's there's implication hidden in them. Uh, Maybe you've never disobeyed in this particular way, but, but take heed lest you fall. Uh, Commands framed in the negative highlight for us uh, where we might be prone to fall, areas of potential danger. Uh, They grow us in wisdom by pointing us to potential pitfalls. So verses 27 to 30, uh, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Uh, Do not say to your neighbor, go and come again tomorrow, I will give it when you have it with you. And do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. These uh, four verses in particular are warnings, right? Commands for how not to treat your neighbor. The first two, verses 27 and 28, they highlight a a passive evil, 
a uh, sin of, of omission, an unwillingness to do good to neighbor. And then the second two, verses 29 to 30, they highlight an active evil, right? A sin of commission, plotting or planning evil against neighbor. Uh, what I trust that we'll find as we consider these four verses is that if indeed we have wisdom that comes from above, it will impact how we love. If indeed we have wisdom that comes from above, it will impact how we love. In the Old Testament, uh, the children of Israel were God's chosen people, right? Meant to display his glory and how they worshiped him and in how they lived for him. Uh, they were to be set apart, right? They were to be holy and unlike the pagan nations that were around them. And it was the law of God that detailed for them how they were to do this. Leviticus 19, verse 2, you are to be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Israel was to live holy lives because the God that they worshiped is holy. They belong to him. And right after God commands this, he transitions into commands about how Israel is to love their neighbor. That's no coincidence. Uh, Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The holiness of God right into loving your neighbor. Our obedience to God and our love for God is intrinsically tied to our love for neighbor. First John 4, verse 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. We love others as an overflow of the love that we have received. Which is why when we don't love our neighbor, we have to call into question, have we truly received God's love? Unwillingness to do good to neighbor. In an effort to emphasize the importance of this idea, uh, Solomon effectively restates the same idea twice. Uh, choosing not to do good to your neighbor uh, when you could, or telling your neighbor, hey, hey, just come back later, when you know you have exactly what they're looking for right there at that moment, this is, this is withholding good. Right? This is the opposite of neighbor love. Friends, we've all done this in one way or another. Somebody's done work for you, and you refuse or you delay to pay them back. Uh, borrowing something from someone and delaying and giving it back. Uh, procrastinating or, or dragging your feet on a task that, that someone else is expecting you to do. Uh, the issue here is that we've forgotten that all that we have, it, it comes from God. Right? Our God has lavished us with his love, and he's called us to be his ambassadors, which means that if we are to represent the God of the Bible, we must love others well. Because loving others well, or, or in this case, not loving others well, it says something about our God. And these four verses act something like brackets, if you will. If withholding good is one end of lack of neighbor love, uh, then intentionally planning evil is the other end of the spectrum. Verse 29 and verse 30, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Uh, much like the previous two verses, these two, they, they build on one another. It starts with a thought, conspiring, plotting, planning to do evil. Then it moves to an action, contending or, or accusing your neighbor for no reason. Friends, the Bible calls this bearing false witness, bearing false witness. Exodus 20, verse 16, the ninth of the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Bearing false witness is lying about someone, particularly with the intention of, of hurting them or ruining their reputation. The fool plans evil against the innocent. The fool contends with the man for no reason because the fool does not understand that God sees all, uh, God knows all, and, the God and God will judge all. Saints, God has made our neighbors in his image. And every image bearer has inherent value uh, and is worthy of respect, which is why that he commands that we love our neighbors as ourselves. But the fool... He, he despises this wisdom and, and acts as their, their own God, deciding how they want to interact with their neighbor rather than submitting to God and how he has told us to relate to our neighbor, specifically with compassion and with love. But friends, God will not be mocked. Uh, Proverbs 19.5 tells us, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who breathes out lies will not escape. 
Pioneer Church, we are capable, because we're sinners, of sinning in this way. We have and will be tempted to tell lies in order to hurt others. So when faced with this temptation, I would encourage you towards three postures. Three postures. Posture number one, confess to the Lord in prayer. Confess to the Lord in prayer. The moment that this thought arises, ask that he would forgive you for even considering treating others this way. Uh, Number two, confess to a fellow member. Somebody who knows you well. Uh, somebody who can understand where you might be tempted to lie about someone. And, and friends, get specific with your confession. Right? A vague confession does no good. Confess specifically what the lie was and how you were intending to hurt this individual. Uh, this is critical because in sharing this, it will actually help fellow members to, to understand your weaknesses and, and hold you accountable going forward. And then lastly, friends, ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness. Depending on the circumstances, even if it didn't need, lead to action, it very well could be appropriate uh, to ask for forgiveness of the person that you had ill intent towards. Uh, But of course, if you did go through and follow through with that lie, uh, go and confess and ask for forgiveness quickly. And then I would actually exhort you to go a step further, right? Wherever that lie might have spread, uh, go and correct the misperception and instead speak well of that individual. Romans 13 verses 8 to 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Well, then how exactly do we love our neighbor? Right, when I say neighbor, I mean those who are kind of in your sphere of influence. Well, church, the list is long and I will leave it up to you to decide on the specifics, but there is one way that you can, compl- that you can uniquely love your neighbor that will impact all other forms of love. Share the gospel, share the good news of Jesus Christ. Tell your neighbor that there is a holy God who has created this world for his glory. Uh, Tell your neighbor that beginning with Adam, we have all been separated from this holy God due to our sin, and therefore we are deserving of his wrath for eternity. But tell your neighbor that this God is also gracious. He has provided for us a way to live at peace with him. He sent his son Jesus into the world who lived a perfect life of obedience to the Father. Uh, Christ willingly died on the cross, and three days later, Christ rose from the grave. Tell your neighbor that in rising from the grave, Christ proved that this sacrifice was indeed accepted on behalf of those who would repent and believe. Encourage your neighbor, tell your neighbor to turn from their sins and to trust in Christ for salvation. Church, the highest love, and I say that unequivocally, the highest love that we can show to our neighbor is telling them about the savior of the world. Philanthropy, it's good. Humanitarian efforts, yeah, that's great. But what about their souls? What about their souls? Right? Habitat for Humanity has never saved a soul. Uh, church, we have the greatest news, news that can save a soul. And we love others best when we share that news. So Pioneer Church, how are we doing at loving others by sharing the gospel? Is, is the gospel informing your other ways that you love your neighbor. Friends, the wise walk compassionately. Now, the difficult reality is that this unloving neighbor depicted in verses 27 to 30 may be living in this evil way and at the same time finding earthly success. Uh, They may be withholding good and getting rich quick. They may be plotting evil and not getting caught And so the temptation that Solomon addresses in verses 31 and 32 is to not envy or be jealous of this man of violence because the Lord ultimately opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Which brings us to our final point for this morning. The wise walk humbly. The wise walk humbly, verses 31 to 35. You know, if we took time to think about it, I think we all know someone or we might even know somebody right now, someone who's lied and kind of cheated or, or stolen their way to success. Uh, think about the classroom, 
right? A fellow student is cheating on tests all year long, getting A's only to get an A in the class when it's all said and done. Or at work, a fellow coworker uh, ends their, uh, inflates their end of year numbers only to get that bonus or promotion that they didn't deserve or earn. Uh, the athlete who took the performance enhancing drugs and then goes on to win the, the championship and never gets caught. Friends, there is no guarantee in scripture that justice for wrongdoing will come on this side of glory. Yet, when we lose sight of eternity, we can all be tempted to envy this person, tempted to do what they've done to gain the success that they have. Well, if she got away with it, well, maybe I can get away with it too. You know, Solomon warns us against this foolish way of thinking in verses 31 and 32. Do not envy a man of violence. And do not choose any of his ways, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. Do not envy. Uh, do not be jealous of. Do not desire to be like this man of violence, the man who desires to do harm, the man who desires to do evil. Uh, don't choose any of his ways. Don't walk down his path. Don't pick up his habits. Don't even think like this individual. Uh, we learn a bit more about this person in verse 31. He's devious. Uh, in other words, he's shady. He's cunning. He operates in the shadows when no one is looking, or so he thinks. Uh, going back to some of the examples I used a moment ago, the person at work who's inflating the numbers, right? That individual does that when the boss isn't looking. Or, or the student in class who's cheating on the test. They do that when the, the teacher's back is turned. Uh, Solomon is warning to not envy this person because they are foolish. Uh, what exactly makes this person a fool? Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Uh, they've either forgotten or they never knew this Lord that we are proclaiming this morning, the one who sees all, uh, the one who knows all. This is, this is pride. Right? This is the opposite of humility. But we have to remember the Lord sees all, he knows all. Psalm 33, verses 13 to 15, the Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned. He looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth, he who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. Although it's not the only reason, a major part of why we should not envy those who willingly and knowingly participate in sin is because God is watching. Friends, God is watching. He sees everything that they're, that they're doing, and he will judge every evil deed. And because of that truth, we should, we should stay far away from them. Right? We should not envy them. In verse 32, uh, we see the Lord finds the violent and devious man to be an abomination. That's a, that's a weighty word, an abomination. In other words, the Lord, he detests this individual. He is disgusted by this individual's evil deeds. If God had a stomach, these evil deeds would cause his stomach to turn. And brothers and sisters, there are times uh, in this fallen world when it may look like the path of sin is the path to getting what we want. But friends, that is a lie from Satan. The biblical reality is that these, this devious man uh, getting what he wants very well could be judgment itself. Uh, we see this idea in Romans chapter 1. Uh, judgment can take the form of being given over to our desires. Uh, and, getting, and in getting our sinful desires, we forego getting God. Uh, so do not be envious of the, the people who sin in this way. Because in the end, uh, they lose. Judgment will come either in this life or the next. Psalm 37 verse 10. In just a little while. Uh, the wicked will be no more. Now, I realize that this can be especially difficult uh, when the wicked are experiencing, again, success. I put quotes on that on purpose. While at the same time, you are experiencing hardship or, or suffering or trials. Uh, but saints, let me encourage you. It's actually in obedience, despite suffering, that we are most like our Savior. This suffering that we're experiencing on this side of glory, it's it's only pruning us. It's, it's only ridding us of our love for this world at the same time, readying us for the next. Friends, all things, all things, hard things, difficult things, all trials work together for the good of those who love him. It's our suffering that is preparing us for glory. 
but we've not made it to glory just yet. So then how do we fight against this temptation to, to envy the devious man? Well, friends, we, we, we live with the end in mind. Uh, the wise are those who live knowing that this life is not all that there is. Right? And then we cultivate this mindset as we give ourselves to different means of grace that God has provided for us to grow. Friends, we read the word, right, which reveals to us the end of those who persist in wickedness. Uh, we get to know older saints, right? We learn from those who have gone before us, who've, who've maybe made mistakes that we can learn from. Uh, friends, we think about our mortality. I know that sounds pretty morbid, but I believe that the more that we remind ourselves that we will die, the more that we'll spend our lives for God's glory. And then lastly, we ought to reflect on God as judge. Hebrews 9, 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Saints, eternal perspective helps us to walk in humility. May we never envy the fool who has forgotten about God. And like a good father, Solomon goes on to give us reasons why we must not envy the fool. Starting in verse 32, for the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools get disgrace. These last four verses, they, they set up for us this compare and contrast dynamic. The first line of each verse, it sets out God's opposition to evil, while the second talks about his favor to the righteous, although I, we do see it reversed in verse 35. I think that's to draw attention to the point the author is trying to make. Uh, if, if envying the violent fool is tempting, here's why you shouldn't, right? Solomon wants his son to see for himself. Look, here are the results. Here are the end. Here's the end of the fool who envies the violent man. Notice the word but in each verse. It's kind of like a dividing line. The abominable versus the upright. The wicked versus the righteous. The scorner versus the humble. The fool versus the wise. Each of these phrases, they're really just meant to reinforce the other. They are, they are driving home the spiritual reality that Yahweh rewards. He blesses those who walk in wisdom. And he rejects or he curses those who walk in prideful wickedness. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. The bottom line is this, verse 35, no pun intended. This verse is the summation of the previous three verses. If we're left with any misunderstanding, Solomon makes it very clear here at the end, the wise will inherit honor, but the fool will get disgrace. The wise are those who fear God and in so doing are able to discern or, or judge what is true, right, or lasting. Well, friends, what exactly is true, right, or lasting? I mean, we all know in this life, people will tell lies, right? The news is regularly debated. Uh, given enough time, we will all be forgotten. But God and the gospel will forever be true, right, and lasting. And those who trust in God and believe the gospel will inherit honor, will receive glory, will be rewarded. Friends, but not because of our own merit or because of our own wisdom, but because of the wisdom and on the merit of another, Jesus Christ. Yes, blessing and reward sometimes come in this life, uh, but as we all know too well, earthly treasures can be taken away. And the wisdom that we need most is a wisdom from on high. And those who turn from their sin and trust in Jesus gain this gospel Wisdom, a wisdom that roots itself in confidence in God, a wisdom that shows compassion to neighbor, a wisdom that bows in humility because the gospel is a message of grace. Now, this is a wisdom that, that culminates in receiving honor in eternity because it gave honor and glory to, here, to, to the Lord here on earth. Friends, the fool, on the other hand, uh, the fool will get disgrace. The fool will receive dishonor and shame, uh, maybe or maybe not in this life, but most definitely in the next. You see, it's the fool who misuses the gifts that God has given him. It's the fool who uses the reasoning skills that God has given them to make wrong decisions. It's the fool who says that there is no God. Uh, therefore, it is foolishness that leads him to eternal ruin. But friends, here's, here's the very, very humbling news. 
uh, we're all born as fools. We're all born as fools. We're all born as sinners in opposition to God and the gospel. We're all born thinking that God's way is foolish and that our ways are wise. 1 Corinthians 1.18, uh, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The gospel seems like foolishness to the unbeliever because it, it doesn't make sense to them. Right? The gospel goes against our, our instincts, against our, our reasoning. Yet here's the, the good news, and that's the rest of 1 Corinthians 1.18. It pleased God through the folly of what we preached to save those who believe. Although we are born foolish and sinful, when a sinner repents and believes the gospel, they are made wise unto salvation. From that point forward, empowered by the indwelling Holy Spirit, the believer can reject foolishness and now walk in wisdom. The wise will inherit honor because the wise fear God. The wise delight in God and what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. The wise live life and make choices, uh, not based on that which is temporal, but instead on that which is eternal. Which is why Pioneer Church while we still have breath in our lungs, we must walk in gospel wisdom because gospel wisdom leads to confidence in God, compassion for neighbor, and blessing from the Lord. Amen? Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you for your goodness towards us in the gospel, uh, that before the foundation of the world, you had a plan, a, a wise plan, a plan that would look like foolishness to us a plan to save sinners. Lord, thank you for your sustaining grace. Uh, Bide, would you continue to grow us in wisdom as we seek to, to live for your glory here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.